all dhammas, the Buddha said, come from desire. All skillful dhammas come from heedfulness. Heedfulness is the desire to be safe, not to fall into danger. And it's based on a realization that your actions are going to make the difference. So there's a bit of discernment in there, together with some goodwill for yourself. And it's based on heedfulness that the whole rest of the path develops. You can see this most clearly in a set of dhammas the Buddha calls the, the five strengths, that which are identical with the five faculties. You start with conviction. Formally, this is conviction of the Buddha's awakening. But what does that mean? One of the main things it means is we have conviction in the power of our actions. After all, the Buddha himself gained awakening through his actions. The how of the awakening came about from his actions. And part of the what, what he awakened to, was the power of action. The power of action to lead to rebirth, the power of action to lead beyond rebirth. And even though these are things we don't yet know, they're good to believe in, they're good to take as working hypotheses. So we take them on with conviction, because the Buddha noted what conviction means believing certain people, believing certain things, and then acting on those things. If you don't act on your beliefs, they're pretty weak, and you can hardly say that you really believe them. When the Buddha points out, certain qualities lead to happiness, other qualities lead away from happiness. The heedful thing to do is carry through, which is how conviction leads to the next strength, which is persistence, which is identical with right effort. You see that there are some things in the mind that are skillful, others that are unskillful, because after all, this is where action comes from. And so you're doing your best to promote the skillful qualities inside. Things like renunciation, goodwill, compassion, and get rid of the unskillful ones. Sensuality, ill will, cruelty. But again, you realize if you really want to be secure, you can't just go around sit thinking nice thoughts, because that tires the mind. And when the mind gets tired, it slips back into doing unskillful things. So if you're really heedful, then the next strength comes along, which is mindfulness. Here again, there's that duality between skillful and unskillful. The basic task of mindfulness is to keep something in mind continually. The formula is to keep focused, say, on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful. And then there's something you put aside, unskillful things, your greed and distress with reference to the world. Mindfulness is very dualistic. It's a point that a lot of people miss. The Buddha illustrates this with his similes about the monkeys. He said there's a safe territory where monkeys can stay and they don't get harassed by human beings. And then there's an area, though, where the monkeys venture into human territory. They're going to meet with danger, as humans set traps for the monkeys. In the same way, when you're practicing mindfulness, you stay away from sensual thoughts. Thoughts about how you'd like to see certain things, or hear certain things, or smell, taste, touch certain things. You have to stay away from those areas, because that's where the hunters are. And you stay within your territory, which is uh, the body in and of itself, like we're doing right now, focusing on the breath. That's an aspect of the body in and of itself. The in and of itself here means that we're looking at the body not in the terms of how it fits into the world, but simply as it presents itself to your awareness. And the breath is one of the things that's right there. And you look at it simply as it is right there. What's it like to breathe? Pay a lot of attention to that. 
When the impulse comes to breathe in, where does that impulse come from? And how does it spread through the body? Does it spread smoothly? Does it spread comfortably? You can take advantage of that ability of the breath to respond to just fleeting thoughts in the mind. In the past it was a problem. A fleeting thought of greed would come through, you'd breathe in a certain way. Anger would come through, you'd breathe in another way. Fear. You'd breathe in ways that were uncomfortable. This would set you up to have a feeling that you had to get whatever that emotion was out of your system. Whereas if you sat back and looked at it, you say, all I have to do is breathe in a different way. You don't feel like I'm compelled to act on the anger or act on the greed or whatever. So you take advantage of that. Because as you stay with the body in and of itself, and you really do keep away any thoughts about the world outside, either things that you're upset about or things that you want out of the world, just put them aside. The mind's going to settle down in the concentration. There's a quality of what's called egakata. Sometimes it's translated as one-pointedness, but the, you take the word apart, eka, one, aga, it doesn't mean point. It can mean the summit of a mountain, but it also can mean a gathering place. This is what you're doing as you get the mind to settle down. It gathers in around one object. So if you're really heedful, as you're mindful, you want to get the mind concentrated and still, because that's when it can, gains power, because it can rest. Of the different qualities involved in the practice, concentration is one the Buddha identifies with food. You nourish the mind, you nourish its sense of well-being, simply by the being still and breathing, but being very mindful and alert at the same time. And as you center in here, you find that the other frames of reference come here as well. There's feelings in and of themselves, or the sense of pleasure that you're trying to create and maintain by the way you breathe. The mind, your awareness, right here. And then the different qualities are either skillful or unskillful. They're all right here. This is where you can see them clearly. What's the heedful thing to do with that? Well, it's to see where you're creating unnecessary stress, unnecessary suffering for yourself, right there in the concentration. The Buddha talks about what he calls five-factored noble concentration. The first four factors are the four jhanas, and the fifth one is the ability to step back from what you're doing and observe it. Because when you're in concentration, you're in what the Buddha calls a state of becoming. You have an identity and a world of experience. In this case, the world is the, the body you're inhabiting, and you are the meditator. And that's how you've got the mind to settle down. But now you're going to step back from that. See, what are you doing that's creating unnecessary stress? In the very beginning, it's going to be simple things like the fact that you're talking to yourself about the breath. What happens if you put that aside? If you put it aside too early, you just go back to your ordinary ways of thinking. You start talking to yourself about the breath again. And what are you saying about the breath? Well, how to breathe so you can stay with the breath with a sense of ease. How you can use that sense of ease, spread it throughout the body, because you want to develop a whole body awareness. Once you've got that whole body awareness, the breath feels good. You don't have to talk about it much anymore. As a John Fuhr once said, it's like calling a water buffalo to you. Call its name, and the buffalo comes. You don't have to keep calling its name. It's there. So you can drop the direct of thought and evaluation, just be with the perception of breath filling the body. But be very careful not to let go of that perception. Otherwise, you start wallowing in the sense of ease. You lose your focus, and nothing gets developed. But if you stay with your one object, you begin to see the movements of the mind around that. This is where insight comes in. 
the Buddha never taught separate insight and tranquility styles of meditation. He taught one kind of meditation, which is right concentration. He said you can develop both tranquility and insight if you do this right. That doing it right means getting the mind to settle in with a sense of well-being. That's the tranquility. And then understanding the process is a fabrication, how you go about doing this. Again, this comes from that ability to step back and watch yourself. So as you develop these five strengths, it's not like you're going from one house to another house to another house. You're really settling into this one house, but you're doing it in a heedful way. And the longer you're here, the more perceptive you are, the more subtle things you can see. So it's all of a piece, everything from conviction all the way through to discernment. You take the Buddha's teachings on what's skillful and what's not skillful, and then you apply them very heedfully to what you're doing right now. So as you settle in, stay here. But watch very carefully what you're doing here. You pull back a bit to watch what you're doing here, but you don't go far away. Because you want to see what you're doing and see the areas in which you're doing things that are causing unnecessary stress, unnecessary suffering. Or as the Buddha said when he's talking in the context of concentration, unnecessary disturbance. You drop those. It's like peeling an onion. You have one layer, then you peel this layer away. No, there's another layer. Peel that one away. You keep peeling until there's nothing left to peel. So it's all happening right here. It's all basically the same thing. It comes from that duality between skillful and unskillful actions, taking it seriously and following through with it. As you let go of the various layers, sometimes you'll be thinking about how one layer is inconstant or it's stressful, or something you can't really control. Otherwise, you use the Buddha's teaching on the three perceptions, not that as something you're going to arrive at a conclusion about. Is it true that the world is marked by these things? That's not what the Buddha's asking you to do. He's asking you to say, how do you use these perceptions as tools? So you can see the drawbacks of the things you're doing, things that seem skillful, but as you start seeing them separately, you begin to realize yeah, there's an unskillful or relatively unskillful part to what you're doing. You drop that. And you don't have to think to yourself, in constant stressful, not self. All you have to do is just watch. Is this worth doing? If it's not worth doing, if it's causing unnecessary stress, why do it? That's the heedful use of these perceptions. And those are the heedful questions. So it's heedful, that's all the way through. And the different strengths simply are different manifestations as it gets more and more precise, more subtle, and goes deeper into the real problems of the mind. Why is it that we want happiness but the things we do cause stress and suffering? If you follow heedfulness as you develop the strengths, you find an answer to that question. And the answer that puts an end to the problem. In other words, you see what you're doing that's causing stress, and you don't realize you <coughs> excuse me, you realize that you don't have to do it. So you stop. That's the pattern that gets followed all the way through. 